Right behind me is the Saturn Unique Tower. It's a luxury condo building that's 49 stories tall and has sat abandoned since 1998. Locally, it's known as the Bangkok Ghost Tower. For a lot of foreigners, this building is seen as nothing more than an urban playground, somewhere you can go and explore. And for a long time, it was a, a not so well kept secret. You could just bribe the security guard and head in. But to many ties, this building has become a symbol of one of the most turbulent times in Thailand's history, the 1997 Asian financial crisis, known as the Tam Yung Goon crisis. If the 97 financial crisis was the only thing that we had to talk about this building, the story would end there. I wouldn't be making this movie, but that's not it. There's the assassination attempt of the Chief Justice of the Thai Supreme Court, a hit movie. There's an international parkour team, suicide, and the bribing of security guards all go into this incredible story of this one building. We're gonna unpack all of that, but to do that, we actually have to go all the way back to before the 97 financial crisis to a time of Thailand's greatest prosperity. And that's where this story begins. From the 80s until the 90s, Bangkok's economy was booming. This growth was more than 9% a year, and for some years, even more. This lasted for more than a decade. During this time of economic growth, there was massive real estate development going on. And this is where the real story of the ghost tower begins. To better understand this time, I jumped on a call with Dr. Dan. He's a Thai economist and a former Bangkok gubernatorial candidate. He understands this time way more than I ever could. 1987 to 1990, the GDP growth was 11, plus 11.7%, I think. And our export growth was very, very big, 20% per year. <laughs> Therefore, because of all these factors, you know, apart from the FDI foreign direct investment that come in largely, the bar devaluation, we also have canceled the, the export tax measure. We used to tax export at that time, but we, we, we canceled that. And by having that, we, we were really uh, doing well. And also we allowed the capital inflow. In 1989, I think, I believe, to 1995, our capital inflow came strongly, become 11% of the GDP, which uh, grew very fast. The capital inflow, which was only 3% in the previous period, we, we jumped from 3% capital inflow uh, to 11% of GDP. And then we, we were allowing the free flow of capital. We also have the situation with the interest rate, Thailand, uh, which is uh, higher than the rest of the world, particularly uh, overseas. Therefore, foreign investment come a lot, money flow in, and we have allowed the private sector to do the foreign loans, and the loan came in huge number, liquidity, increased massively in the whole in the whole economy and we also uh, allow some of the facilities for international banking to allow many privileges tax privileges for example and so those are some of the the background uh, during the period that uh, caused thailand to grow I also talked to Jim because she lived it. She was a teenager during the end of the economic boom and during the financial crisis. So her formative years were shaped by these events. Before financial crisis, 1997, everything here, like, fine. 
looks nice. You see, like a new condo building start there, and people people has money that time really like they can go like um have vacation overseas, can buy like can invest in stock. Oh yeah, stock market that time very big. But after financial crisis, everything kind of crash. So for my family. My father has to close his business because no new project, no client because their company closed too. So no job, no money that time, and with the debt. Lucky that my mom, she is a nurse, so she keep her job. She still get a job, go to work every day. But I'm not sure at that time if the hospital reduced the pay or not. I cannot remember. That time I'm I'm in high school, about to like graduate, and it's like, oh, what one thing I remember we kind of have a plan. Okay, how much we can pay for food every month? We have to plan it well. Which just never happened before that. That's what I remember. Some of my friend has to like. Um, Give up education for short period that they have to go to work and make money to help family. Yes, that time. During this economic boom in Thailand, Bangkok as a city is really beginning to blossom. This is where it's becoming the metropolis that we know it as today, and buildings are starting to spring up all over the place: skyscrapers and shopping malls. And this one architect is starting to really stand out. He's becoming known for this style that sort of oozes 1990s opulence, and that is Rangsan Tersawan, the designer of Saturn Unique. Rangsan studied architecture at Thailand's top university, Chulalongkorn, and then he went to a little school in America, out on the East Coast, for grad school. You might have heard of it, MIT. After grad school at MIT, he moves back to Bangkok and sets up shop, and quickly starts to become a major player in Bangkok's real estate development. Rangsan's style was unique, to say the least. I've seen it described by his peers as a unrestrained mixing of styles. While his style may not have held up over the test of time with his peers, for better or worse, it helped him to establish a name. People. Recognize his buildings when they saw them. Now, two of his buildings that I think really stand out and exemplify his style are Amaran Plaza, which is a shopping mall in the Chitlom section of Bangkok, and it's adorned with these pseudo Greek columns, and it has an office tower behind it. The second. Is what would have been Saturn Unique's sister building, and that is State Tower. It's got these curved balconies with columns on them. You may recognize this tower from the Hangover 2 movie, where the sky bar on the top, called the Bua, has this unmistakable golden dome that's difficult to miss. And if you're in that part of the city, you can essentially pick out that golden dome from anywhere. Let's jump forward to 1990. Rangsan begins construction on Saturn Unique. To do this, he's encouraged by the Thai government to borrow in U.S. dollars, as are numerous other property developers and businesses. The Thai government wants them to do this because it will bring foreign money into the country, and the government is telling these developers and businesses that it's safe because they've pegged the bot to the U.S. dollar at a fixed exchange rate. The interest rate overseas was so low. Uh, I think the number is something like five percent interest rate on average. The Thai interest rate domestically was fourteen to seventeen percent. Therefore, there's a huge gap between the interest rate of, of in Thailand domestically and overseas interest rate. Therefore, it makes sense for the business community to borrow from. Overseas, which is in U.S. dollars, which is the world world uh, world currency. Thailand want to grow the economy, then we need the the money to come in, capital inflow, to grow our economy, to invest in 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 many things, 
and exclusive interest rate gap. Hence, where do we lend our money to in borrowing US dollars into investment in Thai, in Thai economy? There's a, a lot of real estate investment. We, we found that real estate is a major sector that really benefits at that time from the low interest rate. Therefore, they invest heavily in land, in condominium, in shopping centers, in housing, in all kinds of things. Real estate become hugely growing and able to invest. And that's how, how it happened in, in the real estate, for example. You know, if they borrow, say, $100 million, they may not have to convert all of that into Thai baht to use because for a lot of things, we actually, the, how should I say, the, the, the cost of the raw materials actually have to be bought, have to be imported from overseas in the US. So they wouldn't have to convert all those $100 million into, into Thai baht. It sort of had that benefit. Even before that time, you know, money flowing in or uh, had, um, had to had jumped through a lot of um, regulatory hoops and the uh, newly instituted government back then had the vision that they wanted to turn Bangkok into the, the center of capital in this region. So basically trying to promote even freer flows of funds. So without requiring, you know, people to have to convert uh, US dollars without any caps and stuff like that. As it turns out, the style choices of Rankson were far from his most controversial quality. Jump forward to 1993 and he's arrested and charged with the attempted assassination of the head of the Thai Supreme Court, Pramam Chansu. This case would drag on for 15 years and in 2008, Rankson was convicted of the attempted murder charge. Two years later though, in 2010, the Court of Appeals would overturn the conviction. While he was going through the legal system for this attempted murder charge, a charge that everyone knew about because it was against a government official, he was facing some financing issues. It was hard to get financing for this building. So the construction of Saturn Unique was delayed several times over this period. Right up until 1998, a year after the financial crisis, when it would be halted for good. The 97 financial crisis wasn't just Thailand though. It was a massive crash of economies across Southeast Asia and South Korea. Thailand just happened to be the first domino to fall. Government back then had the vision that they wanted to turn Bangkok into the, the center of capital in this region. It would be like a Singapore today. So if you search online, there's this mention of impossible trinity being that, you know, you cannot have a free flow of capital, a free uh, monetary policy. That means you can set the interest rate at any and anyhow you want and then pay an exchange rate. You cannot have all three. Say you pay to the U.S. dollar, when the U.S. dollar uh, raise interest rates, you would have to raise interest rate as well in order to make your local market attractive. We didn't do that. I think around 93 and 94, when the US uh, started to, to raise interest rates, required an incoming inflation. And that resulted in the dollars being stronger, but we kept, we kept bad tech to the dollar, so the bad also became stronger. When the bad became stronger, that means less export. That means the GDP flow would be lower. So the prospect of the country looks bad because of the paid currency. By that point, the local debt market is also bloated. So if you raise interest rates, it's going to hurt a lot of people. So it was also a political suicide to raise interest rates. So it was impossible. So that means the Bank of Thailand would have to try to intervene and, and defend in the open market a lot in order to keep the Thai baht paying at that value with the dollar. And then the central bank also had to spend more and more research trying to defend the bar. And by 1997, I think a lot of, you know, hyenas smell the blood, <laughs> right? They, 
they sort of thought that okay, this is coming the the soon enough. You know, the central bank will lose. You know, and, you know the prospect of the economy is not looking any better. So they started speculating again. Mr. Boone mentioned some hyenas. What he was talking about are investors and institutions that were taking up short positions against the bot, betting that it was gonna fail, and also attacking the bot, hoping to get it to fail. One of those investors happened to be a very famous one, George Soros. Now, to dive into his role in the 1997 financial crisis and ultimately the legacy of this ghost tower, I talked to amateur historian and amazing storyteller, Charlie Hubbard. Prior to the uh, uh, to the uh, Asian crisis of '97, uh, Soros had about a one billion dollar bet against the Thai bot. He sold it short. Soros blames the knowledge of that bet that the uh, Thai central bank had as a more of a cause of the uh, financial problems that followed afterwards, because he said that the uh, central bank of Thailand mismanaged the Thai bot. What had happened to Thai bot 10 years prior to this 1997 financial crisis, the Thai bot was pegged to the U.S. dollar. What happens when a currency starts, starts to go down, very often governments intervene by buying up the currency and elevating the price on the Forex market. It's a fool's errand because it never works. It works temporarily. You know, the Forex market is bigger than any given yeah. nation state. And eventually the market forces overpower even a central bank's uh, ability to, uh, to maintain the level of any particular currency. They knew that uh, the peg between the dollar and the Thai bot was coming to an end. And uh, according to Soros, they mismanaged that. Uh, and he simply bet on that mismanagement and, and won that, you know, that billion dollar short bet. That's not the way Thai people see it. They think that there was some nefarious you know, political stuff going on that he helped engineer the crisis. Now, one of the things that kind of belies that argument is there was a bet against the Thai bot by the Tiger Fund at the time that was three times bigger, it was about $3 billion. And that's an Asian fund. So if there was any mismanagement or, or you know, nefarious kind of mechanisms at work to help devalue, you know, politically devalue the Thai bot, you know, they would be the ones that, you, that I would be looking for. Now, do I know for certain that none of this happened? I no. So the shorting of the bot and the ultimate unpegging of it from the US dollar sent the Thai economy into a tailspin. Overnight, the bot devalued and anyone who had borrowed in US dollars was now underwater on that loan, forced essentially into default. A lot of small and medium businesses would outright fail as a result of this, leaving a workforce with no jobs and no way to support themselves and their family. So when I see the ghost tower, like today, is remind me of the rough time, that time. It kind of like, what do you call it, like flashback? About like, oh, when I was a teenager, what happened? Like, how I scratch, how I was like, so sensitive about money. That's what I think, like when I see that building. Lucky I didn't pass it every day. So just sometime that I see it and like, if I have time to look at it, I will think about, oh my God. It just remind me, okay, do not get loan for the thing that maybe you cannot pay it back. Or like one thing is like, make me think about, oh, what I gonna invest? Will it return or will it just gone? So I don't know, maybe it's kind of make me scared of like things that relate to money. There are many factors involved in the many projects become insolvent during that time. After we floored the bar, because we were on the so-called fixed exchange rate with a basket of currency, 
Now we float the bark and we call it managed float. In a way, it's, it's not really that managing, but it's, it's managed float. With free fall of the bar, the bar become weaker. Used to be 25 bar to a dollar, become 56 bar to a dollar. It was the weakest bar we ever had in the history of Thailand. All the various businesses who I have borrowed from overseas dollars at 25 bar per dollar now have to pay back at 40, 50 bar per dollar. Which business have enough profit to do that? And all business, virtually, you can almost say all, who are big business, borrow somewhat from overseas. I mean, they re recall your loan, and they have the right to do so because they gave you a short-term loan. You have to return the money, and you don't have the money to return because all your money was made into the ground, into the cement, into the building, into the, all those housing estates. What happened? You can't pay that what to, what to do. Now you're at the mercy of the people who loan you the money. In response to the financial crisis, the Thai government actually took very swift action and they had to partner with the IMF. That wasn't a super popular decision at the time, but it was really their only option. There was nothing else the Thai government could do to stop the devaluation of the bot. They needed the backing of the IMF. As a result, the financial crisis only lasted about two years. In 1999, it was essentially over. But if you talk to Thai economists, they'll tell you that the economy never really fully recovered to its former glory. And a lot of the momentum and progress that Thailand made economically and business-wise never returned. The first two years after the collapse, after the crisis, we, we went to negative growth, huge negative growth for two years. And until 1999, it started turning to become positive. But it ne never returned back at that time to the original before crisis, but it started turning positive in 1999. And we have to go through the IMF procedures. We need to help, help from the IMF to show up the confidence giving us some money that we need to return. Despite the economy's recovery in 99, because of his ongoing legal issues, the economy never returning to its former glory, Rankson never restarted construction on Saturn Unique. And while other buildings started up construction again, Saturn Unique just sat there and has sat there for over 25 years. Now, it was this inability to restart construction that really began to build the lore around this building being the ghost tower. Not long after 1998, when construction halted, it was a not so well kept secret that for a small bribe, you could get the security guard to let you into the building to go explore and have free reign of 49 stories of desolate urban waste. As a result, backpackers and tourists and locals started to go there in droves. Over the years, that amount just kept growing. Behind me, you can see the entrance where people used to come and bribe the guard to get in to go explore this tower before the owner put a stop to all that, of course. All of that would start to change in 2014 when the body of a Swedish national was found on the 43rd floor. He had bribed the security guard to let him in, climbed up to the 43rd floor, and hanged himself. His death sparked conversation in both online and traditional media about this unfettered access to the building. That conversation began to put pressure on the new owner of the building, the son of its original developer, Pansit Tersawan, to get this access under control. And while I'm sure there was some policy changes put into place on his end, the next year, things would really kick up a notch when members of professional parkour team, Team Farung, Jason Paul and Sean Wood would make their way into the building and create a video of them doing parkour on this abandoned structure that went absolutely viral.
the interesting thing for me was it it went super viral in Thailand. Like it, it started getting played on a, a bunch of the news stations over there, and it was a bit controversial. And I remember sitting at a restaurant with my friend's brother one day, and we sort of looked up at the news, and right at Jason's faces, we just planted on the TV screen. And he kind of looked at me, and he's like, "I guess you guys have done it." I'm like, "What?" He's like, "Well, you're on the news in Thailand, so well done." And you know, it was part of a time where we were putting a lot of content on YouTube, so that video was one of the ones that just hit and popped and then we got media exposure and then suddenly like everyone within my network you know that kind of knew we did parkour it was like the the video that because it was dangerous and it made people's palms sweaty and there was a couple of really dangerous moves up there it was the one that our friends that didn't quite know what we were doing it was the one they were able to show people and kind of go like this is the cool thing my friends are doing and it was kind of cool to see our our faces planted on the news uh yeah it, it was a, a fun experience <laughs> The video blowing up no doubt put way more pressure on Panson and he ended up filing an official complaint with the Bangkok police against Jason and Sean, including pictures or screenshots from the video itself. No doubt placing the two of them in the center of a controversy I'm sure they never expected to be in. Because of the sort of media exposure that we got, the owner of the building apparently filed a, a court case against us. And so there was a couple of different videos that they found and sort of said, these guys are crazy, they shouldn't be doing it. The thing was, we never really were doing anything we weren't supposed to until we weren't supposed to. And what I mean by that is, you know, really early on, we weren't navigating around the, the security officers. Like we were going up, we were saying hello. They started putting lights up the center of the staircase at one point because they were making so much money out of it. It wasn't until suddenly the owner of the building must have caught on that things sort of escalated a little bit, but we never directly had anyone contact us. It was sort of, we saw the same news article that everyone else did. And I think we even sort of went back and paid a security guard after that again. <laughs> and and our, mine and Jason's faces were sort of planted on the side of the building at that stage. It wasn't long after that video went viral where it became basically impossible to get entry into the ghost tower. All the interior doors had been chained or welded shut and the security guards weren't accepting bribes anymore to let people in. No doubt there was immense pressure placed on them to not let this happen anymore. I reached out to Pansit, the current owner and son of the original developer of the ghost tower asking if you'd be interested in doing an interview for this movie and to my surprise he actually got back to me but basically to tell me he was reluctant to talk about it and i can really understand why he's an architect himself and no doubt that this building this project which he wasn't even really involved with that he was sort of thrown into is going to define the majority of his legacy However, after a few email exchanges, he actually kind of opened up to the idea, said we could talk when he got back from a vacation. And despite me sending some follow-up emails when he was supposed to be back, for lack of a better term, he ghosted me. Again, I can't fault him for any of this. He seemed like a great dude in the conversations that we did have via email. So I can completely understand why he's not interested to talk about it. And while Pansit has actually tried to distance himself from this project, from what I can see, he doesn't do a ton of media about it, he hasn't completely distanced himself. He has embraced it a bit. In 2016, he did an interview with a, a very well-known Thai presenter named Woody, where he discussed sort of the history of the building, talked about people wanting to visit it as an urban exploration site or as an abandoned attraction, about the legalities and also the liability of that that's put on him when people do go in and, you know, essentially putting him at risk if something were to happen. Now, he also discussed the Team Farung video, basically speaking out against it, which I think was a surprise to no one. More recently, Pansit wrote a book. 
And this book basically talks about his father's involvement in the project, the charges against him, the financial crisis, sort of the what went on financially to cause the project to go insolvent. Ian talks about some of the projects that he's allowed to take place in the building, including the Thai horror movie, The Promise. The Promise was a 2017 release. It fit well with the story of the financial crisis and the backdrop of that movie. I don't want to give too much away. If you like horror movies, the Thai movie industry does horror better than most. So I would definitely recommend checking it out. But it really fit and I'm glad that he sort of allowed it to be used because it did give an interesting context, especially to Bangkokians or people who have visited that area and seen the building. It added a little bit to the lore though. So for someone trying to distance himself and who doesn't want people visiting it, that was an interesting choice on his part. To try and flush out what really makes this building so iconic, what draws people to it, I got in touch with Dax Ward. He's a world-renowned urban X photographer. He has an amazing collection of work of these abandoned places around the world, the ghost tower included. Yeah, I mean, the first time I saw it, so many questions popped to mind, like, what is that place? What happened there? And then, you know, uh, just start hearing stories from friends about going up and watching the sunrise or the sunsets and how amazing it was when you're, you know, surrounded by Labua Grand or the state towers, you know, fancy, expensive restaurant and bar and all these high, so upscale places. And then you've got and where you can go and watch the sunset or whatever, but this place is different. This is, you know, f almost free. You can just go up and there's nobody there and it's got its own special vibe. I think the ghost tower is so compelling for so many people and, and garners so much attention in this region and around the world because it's become kind of an icon. I mean, first of all, the location, it's right in the city center, right? A, a place that has many city, city centers. This is the place that everybody sees as they drive downtown around the Silom Saton area or they ride the BTS across the Pantaxi and everybody sees it. Local people see it, tourists see it. Everybody that lives in Bangkok has seen it at least once and it just sticks out. It's unavoidable. You can't you can't just turn away and ignore it. It's always there. And so therefore that alone is going to garner a lot of attention. The fascination lies in uh, just this enormous shell, grungy, concrete skeleton amongst what are some pretty nice building state towers right there next to it? And it's, you know, glistening and white and bright and, uh, you know, modern and all that. But this one is just, uh, I think, the size of it and the scale and also the history, the, the recent history and the history in the last 20, 25 years now since it's been abandoned. The fascination in abandoned places in general has a lot to do with the questions that you ask when you see pictures or videos of places like that. It's all about the questions, right? What is that place? Where is it? How did you get in there? What's the history of that place? What happened there? What's going to happen to it in the future, right? And this is you know, no different than any other abandoned place in that respect, but you know, just more so because it's not in the middle of the countryside. It's right in the middle of the city. One thing I thought was really interesting that Dax talked about and that we sort of geeked out about a bit was our appreciation of street art and how he really likes when he finds these abandoned places and there's this really high quality, unique street art or murals that are done inside. And he said he saw a lot of that inside Saturn Unique, inside the ghost tower, which made it an even more special experience for him. I really like street art. I like talented graffiti artists, mural artists, not the taggers, but the guys that go in, the men and women and whoever that go in and put a lot of thought into their work and a lot of meaning behind it. It was not just some initials or some fancy words. And that had a few pieces that were at the time that were just, just amazing. And that was the first thing that struck me when I went in and it was a reflection. I think I poured a little bit of water as well to make more of a reflection, but this really beautiful piece uh, who I just got the name of the artist the other day, actually, I found them on Instagram and that stuck out. And then, you know, as far as the rest, the floors and the rooms and things like that there's not really anything different from those than a lot of other concrete shell kind of buildings in the city but once you get to the top and once you get that view of the Chorong Krong, you know Bangrak Yanawa river area it's special it's unlike any other abandoned building even in the city i mean some other abandoned towers have nice views but this one's the heart of bangkok 
and that feeling once you make it to the top after climbing all these stairs up to the very top once you finally make it it's a, it's it's a special it's a special feeling and it's a special view and it's uh it's that's what's unique about Southorn Uni. With its history being tied to the 97 financial crisis, one of the most turbulent times for Thailand, its prominent location in the city right near the Chao Phraya River, you know, a, a stone's throw away from the financial district, you know, its injection into pop culture with things like the Team Farang video that went super viral worldwide and being included in the movie The Promise, which just reinforce a lot of those other issues with it, its location, its history, it compounded all of that. You can easily understand why Saturn Unique, the ghost tower, is iconic in Bangkok. Why it means so much to so many different people and why people are drawn to it. For a lot of tourists, this is a bucket list destination, somewhere they want to see when they finally make it to Thailand. This abandoned skyscraper in the, the middle of Bangkok. To Rangsin and Pansit, this building is undoubtedly a blemish on their legacy, something that they probably don't want to be remembered for. To many Thais, this building is a reminder. It's salt in the wound of a time where all of their momentum to be the financial, the economic, the business leader in the region was just pulled to a halt. As it stands today, the future of the ghost tower is unknown. Maybe it stays as it is for the next 25 years, empty, abandoned, people looking at it from the BTS or from the street. Maybe it gets finished. Someone comes along, invests money and finishes the project. Maybe it gets condemned, knocked down and something new gets built in its place. Regardless of the outcome, regardless of what becomes of the ghost tower. I think it's pretty safe to say that the legacy of that building is gonna live on for a very long time. If you made it this far in the video, thank you so much. I know 40 minutes is a long time for a video. These longer documentary type movies are the direction that the channel is going in. Subscribing to the channel is the best way to support us. Liking and sharing this video is a great way as well. If you wanna support us even more, you can become a channel member. And beyond that, you can join our new Patreon, which will be linked down in the description. And over there, you'll get early access to these projects, as well as a look behind the scenes as to what we're working on, what's coming up next. I hope to see you guys over there. Thank you immensely for your support. We'll see you in the next one.